in the beginning, when in the height heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name, and the primeval Apsu who begat them, and chaos, Tiamut, the mother of them both. Their waters were mingled together, and no field was formed, no marsh was to be seen, when of the gods none had been called into being, and none bore a name, and no destinies were ordained. Then were created the gods in the midst of heaven. Don't click away. Not yet. Even if you're frightened. For it is of the utmost importance that we see the beginnings of our tale as a book among others. Dark stories. Where time ticks slowly unto death and your sentence is served out until the very end. The beginnings of Babylon are recorded when Apsu and Tiamut, origin and chaos, come together in a sea of crashing waves. And from their blending comes a series of gods these primary gods all have control over one primary aspect of existence. But as more and more gods are created, another god that Apsu and Tiamut did not expect is born of the waters. Kingu, the god of evil. Tiamat and Apsu cannot control the evil that now plagues their world. They recruit Marduk, the founder god of Babylon, to quell the evil of the world, to crush its head. And of the blood that spills from the veins of Kingu, humanity is born. A dirty mixture of the blood of evil and kingship. And because of the great debt now owed to Marduk, humanity is imprisoned, set to serve in humble submission to the king of the gods. The Egyptians, of course, see things differently. Our tale today comes from Heliopolis. In the beginning, a sea of chaotic waters clash onto the shores of time, and out of the waters Atum arises. Atum creates eight gods, and together these nine gods and goddesses create everything in existence, while the eye of Atum, like the sun, circles and surveys all that's in existence. When suddenly, one day the eye of Atum separates from the body of the god. And now with no power or control, Atum sends two of the gods to recapture his eye. And when they find it, a violent, bloody battle ensues. And in victory, the gods force the eye of Atum to cry. And of the tears that run from the eye of Atum come humanity, the sorrow of the gods. And now humanity lives out their lives to please the gods and goddesses and never make them cry again. So where does our story start? How does our story fit into the grand narrative that humanity had crafted already? How does our story differ? 
Well, our epic invites us to see with more than our eyes and hear with more than our ears. For when we do that, well then we see the God behind it all. Our story starts... In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. Our story starts with a God who does not create existence with other gods. But rather, our God creates existence out of nothing. Ex nihilo. For existence resides within himself. God is Chodesh. Holy, set apart, other than, as in completely other than anything conceivable in existence, including the gods of the other stories, for they are, after all, created by man. And on the second day, God creates the sky for the light. The land on the third day after the sky was made and filled with plants. Plants like trees with seeds bearing fruit. And then God begins to fill that which he has created. The sun and the moon created for the sky, and the creatures of the sea and air were made to fill God's expanding vision of reality. But no other day could quite compare to the sixth day, where God makes animals to fill the earth and finally, human beings, the crown jewel of his creation. God calls all that he makes good not indebted servants and not out of his sorrow, but out of the humble soil of creation and out of his own breath and spirit. He crafts the dirt creatures in his own image holy, set apart from all else that he had made. And in Egypt and in Babylon, there was one way to bear the image of God, and that was to be the king. For being the king made you a sovereign ruler just like the gods, but here, set apart as always, God makes all of humanity in his own image. Rulers, holy, set apart, male and female, he makes them. Humility and royalty, humanity is made. And God calls humanity abundantly, forcefully, exceedingly, very good. And God rested on the seventh day from all of the work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy for on it he rested from all his work of creation. You see, on the earth there was a country called Eden, and in Eden God had planted a magnificent garden. If the universe were God's kingdom, then Eden was his holy temple. You see, in many ancient stories of the gods, many of them had temples, but none like this God. The universe is God's kingdom of rule, and this land in Eden is his most holy space, the holy of holies. Yet, God took the man that he had made from the dirt and placed him in this garden. He placed him in the holy of holies to work the land and to cultivate that same goodness that God displayed in creation out into Eden and beyond. This God was unlike any other God in thought at the time. A benevolent, caring, all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God who was intimately invested in his creation. The idea was simple, and the plan was set. But the plan was unlike any other in thought at the time. He knew what he was doing. He understood that he and he alone was the arbiter of right and wrong. And to put that power into the hands of his creation would have a devastating echo throughout history. But he knew that it was the only way. 
So God took the man that he had made and put him in the garden, where there were two trees in the midst of the garden. And he told the man not to eat from the tree of knowing good and bad, but the tree of life the man had full access. In the meantime, Adam was to begin to name all of the animals, partaking in the divine act of creation and naming. All the while, God had been keeping a special eye out for a helper suitable for Adam to help him tend the garden and spread the knowledge and presence of God out into the world. But God found no helper suitable for Adam. This was not good. So he put Adam into a deep sleep, and from his side, not his foot, not his head, but from his side, God makes a helper fit for Adam. When Adam awakes, all he can find himself doing is singing praises. This at last, last is bone of, is my, bone. Bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. God places them side by side and commands them, be fruitful like the trees, multiply, and in so doing subdue the earth, bring the divine, magnanimous, good and holy, tender dominion of God out into the wilderness and order the earth under God's domain. Adam, meaning humanity, and Heve, meaning mother of all living, humanity and life, Adam and Eve, side by side as ambassadors of the great King of the Universe. When one day, a slithery serpent finds his way onto the path of human history. Now, much mystery surrounds this sly encounter. We aren't sure why there was a talking snake in this perfect garden, or why Eve thought it so normal. We don't know why Eve could understand this creature, or what he was even doing there in the first place. All we know is that in rebellion or submission, this snake was not going to undo the cosmic narrative that God was writing. And so, he curls around a branch of the tree and begins to constrict the heart of Eve, who had been standing there noticing the tree's beauty. Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Well, the woman said to the servant, oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, and neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And the plan of God was set in motion. Adam and Eve now hold in their hearts and in their minds a corrupted account of right and wrong. And this corruption began to have far-reaching consequences starting here. They know of their guilt. They run and they hide. But when God finds them among the trees, he does what he has to do. Like a train leaving the station, Adam and Eve are severed from the presence of God. God cannot let them live in the garden any longer. For behold, the man has become like one of us, God said, in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever in the fallen state that he finds himself in. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim in a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Here, 
We see some of God's most central characteristics on display as he clothes Adam and Eve. We see that he is just in moving them out of the garden. We see that he is merciful by not giving the humans what they deserve. And finally, we see that he is gracious in giving them a gift that they do not deserve. The question of the biblical plot unfolds before our eyes. How will God reconcile humanity back to himself? Will he? And God does not leave us without a glimmer of hope in the consequences of sin. For from the seed of the woman will come a man. A man to bruise the head of the snake, even though the snake will bite his heel. And this is the hope we are left clinging to. That one day, a man will come to destroy the mysterious snake that slithered into the garden and around the hearts of humanity. A curtain was placed in the temple then and there, you see. A curtain that would not be broken by any man, save him who would crush the very head of the snake. The plan of God is official. No longer will eternal life be ever attained by human means or striving. Only by the gracious will of God will eternal life be gifted to man. Only God will have the power to give the gift of eternal life. And so, it is when Cain is born that hope in our heart rises all the more zealously like a new dawn in the morning. Cain means gotten, because as Eve says, she had gotten him by the help of the Lord. You see, Cain is born of the seed of the woman. Until one day, when Cain presents an offering to God, an offering of grain since he worked the ground. Abel also presented an offering to God, an offering of animal since Abel kept the sheep. God found favor for Abel's offering. Of this peculiar story, we must ask several questions. But at the end of the day, we see that God is still determined to see his plan be pushed into motion. God instructs Cain in the ways of right and wrong, good and evil, saying, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. And here, Cain is met with a choice. A tree of life or a tree of knowing right from wrong. And Cain makes his choice. He takes his brother Abel out into a field one day. And while they were in the field, Cain attacks his brother Abel and kills him. We see now that Cain is not the representative of God, the man who will crush the head of the snake. But rather, Cain is a representative of humanity, willing to be crushed by the snake instead. From here, the story takes a swift spiral downward along the slippery slopes of human lineages, leading humanity from the light of the garden, through the heart of Cain, and straight down into Lamech. The pinnacle of human evil up until this point, Lamech takes many wives and even kills a man for attacking him. We get a lineage of humanity that is over and over and over again choosing for themselves the difference between right and wrong and refusing to allow God to define it for them. Meanwhile, the narrative presents a second family tree for humanity, the line of Seth, another son of Adam who, like Abel, found favor among the one true God. And while there is much to be said, you may see an unusual pattern of longevity in the lives of these men who walk with God. This is surely a way for the author to tell us two things. One, the humans who walk with God in the book of Genesis are the mighty men of their day, since in all epics and legends of that time, famous kings and warriors had unusually long life. But secondly, compared to these ancient legends, the men of Genesis do not live long at all. This is not only communicating the might of these men, but their indefinite folly as well. Either way, 
Seth's lineage leads us down a path of people who deliberately choose life with God, and it leads us all the way up to the family of Noah. A family tree of people who choose to know God over their own desires is a glimmer of hope against a bleak backdrop of human depravity. And that glimmer of hope might shine brightly in the darkest of hours if it weren't for the story injected right into the center of our tale today. For you see, a strange story leads up to the flood of judgment where the sons of God take women freely as wives. You see, we're all reminded of Lamech, and we foresee future injustices on the horizon. But the story is shrouded in all too opaque a mystery. And the mystery hinges on this phrase here. The sons of God. Bene ha'elohim. To that end, there are three basic theories behind the meaning of this mysterious phrase. For the most robust analysis of this phrase that I've come across, consider watching Inspiring Philosophy's video on Genesis 6a, the Nephilim. Anyway, the first theory is that the sons of God refer to mighty warriors and kings who lived on the earth in those days and treated others unjustly in order to make for themselves large and boastful harems, most reminiscent of Lamech. A second theory proposes a spiritual rebellion, that the sons of God translated literally would render the sons of the gods and refers to the counsel of Yahweh set forth in the book of Job. This counsel is in rebellion to the goodness of the created order set forth by the one true God. A third theory posits that this phrase refers to the human lineage of Seth, being the righteous sons of God and intermarrying with the wicked daughters of Cain. No matter what, we know that when God sees humanity, he sees the chaos of the uncreated world swirling around in their hearts. He says that every heart, every intention of every man is evil continually. And the blood that man had spilled on the ground is a flood to God, crying out in a roaring tumult. So in response to the flood of violence and death that has overtaken the world, God will flood the earth with rain, washing it clean. Now, we're not sure if every intention of Noah's heart was evil continually, but given the severity of the language used by the biblical author and the later biblical context of this story, we can assume that Noah's intentions are in fact evil. But Noah walked with God. Noah believed that God was the king and that he was in charge. And that was counted to him as righteous. God chooses life for Noah. And in turn, Noah chooses a life with God. He commands Noah to build an ark, to carry his righteous promise forth through the chaotic wilderness that he was about to unleash. And in the ark was going to be contained the created order, Noah, his wife, and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it began to rain. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights, flooding the earth, and with it, the violent, corrupt wickedness. When the rains subside, Noah sends a dove who brings back an olive branch. God's wrath has indeed subsided, and with it, the floodwaters. A rainbow appears in the sky over Noah, and God makes a covenant with Noah, declaring that he will never again flood the earth with rain. God commands Noah to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth and to subdue it. We can see this new beginning, calling back to the garden that was in Eden, a place where God's presence can be unhindered by evil and humanity can flourish with God. Since we know that the snake crusher will bring humanity back to the garden that was in Eden, we can see the snake crusher in Noah crushing the head of the snake. That is, until Noah plants a garden. In this garden, Noah gets drunk and naked and lies in his tent. While the events of this story are also not entirely clear, we know that one of his sons, 
Ham does something to his father Noah while he is naked. We can assume that this act is shameful, given the fact that his other two sons need to cover his body, a sign that in the last garden meant Noah needed to be ashamed. And when Noah wakes up, he curses Ham's son Canaan. And from this small family comes a host of nations from all over the world, many of whom play vital roles in our tale to be told. But as our story closes out, these nations begin to come together, and with them comes the knowledge and ability to choose right from wrong for themselves, without allowing the God of the created universe to have a say in their actions. These nations come together, and they begin to build. Brick by brick, they build with hubris in their hearts a tower to overthrow God. A coup is on his hands from the very creatures that he created. From the dust of the earth they came, and now they seek to overthrow God. And so God scatters them, these dirt creatures, the crown jewel of his creation. He's forced to scatter them all over the world, each with their own language, each with their own set of values for how the world should be run, each with their own ideas of right and wrong. They're scattered. The plan of God is now well underway. For you see, from the destruction of this temple ziggurat comes a small family from Ur in the land of the Chaldeans. For from the line of Seth came Noah, and from Noah came Shem, and from Shen's lineage Arpachshad, who is the great-grandfather of Shelah, who is the father of Peleg, who is the father of Nehor, who is the father of Terah, the father of three sons, Abram, Nehor, and Haran. For while it may not seem like it now, the destruction of this very tower will bring forth a family. Not a worthy family. Not a royal family. But a family taken from the dust of the Tower of Babel. And from them, will come the very man who will crush the head of the snake. This man will take upon himself a flood of judgment greater than that at the beginning, and in so doing, gather those scattered at Babel and make for himself a nation given under his own rule and reign. This was Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time.